It's starting. It's starting. Click on join meeting. Please enter your name. Ryan. Hello? Hello? Looking for audio. Hello. Hi there. Hi. I still can't see you though. Can you enable your camera? Yeah, I thought I did. It asked me if I wanted to. Let me go up here. Start video. Yes. Is it working? It there we are. Is. How's it, okay, how's so, it going? How's it going, guys? It's going great. Good, How are you good. doing, Brian? Good, good. Can you all see me okay? Yeah, yeah so. Okay, I'm just going to get my pen and piece of paper here in case you guys say something I need to write down. Okay, so you know what I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually get you all framed up first because we need to get you framed the way we're going to have it, that when it airs on television. Okay. So first off, I need you to... Bring your camera down so that it's not on an upward angle, so that it's like just at eye height, if that makes sense. So you might need to move your camera into a physically higher spot so that you're not looking down at it. Well, I have it on a, um... oh, let me put a box underneath it, hang on. Perfect, that, yeah, box and books are always your friend. Well, no, momento for it for more. So who am I speaking with besides you, the, the handsome fellow with the beard there? <laughs> well, thank you very much. My name is Andrew Forbes. I'm the uh, I'm, I'm helping out with the technical side, so I'm going to be doing the recording, uh, so that you guys could just have the conversation. I was actually I just wanted to introduce myself and thank you again. Okay. Uh, and then I'm actually going to turn off my video camera so that I, and mute myself out, kind of thing, so I don't get in the way of anything. So. Okay. Um, nice to meet yeah, you, Andrew. Great to meet you, though. Thank you again for this. Thanks. Yeah. I put this right, up. I'll see you in a bit. Thanks. Okay. Take care. I put this up on a box. Is that better? Yes, it is. Um, and then if you can back up a little bit. And then if you could angle the camera down slightly. I think the, the, yeah. the camera lens is in the top left corner on my iPad. Is it possible to move everything so that you don't have the window in the frame? And so like turn everything over this way a little bit? Well, then I'll move my light back. I have a light source there as well. You want me to center up more? Um, just because we're going to need you to be on the other side. So I need you to be closer to your window and your light. And then I need you to be looking towards where the window, like the... Okay, I can't get any for farther left because I got shelves and stuff right here. Okay, so maybe we can move your... Can we move the camera further? To the right? To, to my the right? Yeah. Yes. Maybe that will work. I have a light source here, see, behind me. That's a sliding glass door to the outside. I oh, know okay. you didn't want that to be in the background, you said. No, that's the thing. So we want to just kind of frame it up. What do you think, Andrew? 
come back. Because it's quite busy. Is there somewhere in your house that has just like a plain wall? Or can you have it so that the window, can you turn it anyway so that the window is facing your face and like whatever's behind, like to your oh, right now? Is oh, I see what you're saying. So I got to figure it out like this, but I don't know how high I can get it. I got a lot of shelving behind me. Uh -huh. so it's still got to come up more. And then if we can... So then that's part's okay, and then if we can just, sorry, this is all of the joy of pandemic television. It's okay, I'm just trying to help get where you want me to be, that's no, of all. of course. I'll put no, the no, camera no, up no, higher, no, maybe no. that, that'll help if I get it up higher. I don't think the camera needs to be higher, I think if anything it just needs to be like, I need you to have more room between you and the camera so that we can get some headspace without too much clutter. I got you. So you want me to sit back? Yeah. And then, and then if you can sit back, but then pull the camera down and then to your right, slightly. And now lean back again. And then if you personally can move it slightly, slightly to your left, just like the ever so little amount. And then, but not the camera. So I need the camera to stay the other way a little bit more. Back this way. Yeah. How's and that, it's, Andrew? It's very bright. Actually, that that little ring light that you've got. Um, I think we're getting enough illumination on your face from the uh, from the exterior light. Okay, I have another little light here that I have on. I turn. I can uh, turn. Okay, yeah. Let me turn that one off as well. It's going to get dark here in about 15, 20 minutes. So. Oh well, then in that case, we should definitely be okay. Because um, okay. I'm seeing the. Just seeing your, yeah. Are you comfortable without glasses? No. no. I've been wearing them for 65 years. <laughs> Six, well, there you go. 60 they years. They look great <laughs> on you. It's just there's a little bit of a glare. That's the only thing I'm concerned about. So we're seeing your camera in your glasses right now. I see. That's um, a little bit better. Well, let's see what I can do to try to help the situation here. Because I can see myself in the camera, and you want no glare? I think that's better. Yeah, I can't go without yeah, glasses. That's, that's, that's not me. Yeah, 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 no. No, yeah, no, no that's no, totally no, fair. No. I appreciate that. It's... You want me to tip the camera you're... down a little? If it's possible to tilt it down a wee bit more, if that's cool, please. Yeah, and... Um... Yeah, let's try it. That's definitely better. Yeah. I turned that. Oh, I, I turned the light off that was behind. Did you want that other light that's behind the camera? I I quite like with with the the one that's on your right side, the the kind of the warmer lights mm -hmm. uh, that's on the right side. I wonder, is it possible to take the iPad and slide it to its to your right a little bit, just to try and bring it back around? I'd love to push you in front of the uh, basically line your head up with the window and the blinds, if that's cool. Something kind of like that. What does that feel? No. That's better. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Now let me. I can. I can adjust this other light. So if you need it, if you need more or less, it's it's on a uh, a large uh, extendable arm. And like an articulating arm, right? Yeah. So I can move it if you want. If you need more light in my face, I got that. Takes yeah, it's 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 more again. It's just showing up like in your glasses. We're just trying to make sure that we uh, we don't see too much of it. Uh, I see. Uh, well, I can I can yeah, tip it. So you, I can tip it down, or I can tip it up and tip it away. Maybe tip it up and away. Is it possible? Is there any room on the shelf to slide it to your left a little bit more? Sure, I can I can move the arm. Like oh, this. that'd be great. That's helpful. And where are you looking right now? Are you looking at your your image, or are you looking at? Uh, I'm looking at. Looking at us I'm looking at my image, which is on the bottom right of the iPad screen. Gotcha. You can. You should be able to, to just grab that little window and move it up to the top left of the screen. Would you mind doing that, please? Okay. And what do I do? Touch the plus or the minus? You should be able. To, it should be able to drag over. I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, well, I'm trying it with my eye pencil, and that's not working. I'll try it with my finger, and that's not working. 
if I could get it, out, right? if I could get it to the top, oh well, now I got multiple cameras. So if I could get it to the top left, I think that's where the actual camera lens is on this iPad. Yeah, that'd be awesome to be able to line those up. If that's cool. Yeah, but maybe there's a release you have to do or something on that to for me to move that. Um, let me do a quick uh, quick search around here for one moment. I'll get an answer on that. Yeah, I'm pretty new with the iPad myself. No worries. Uh, Those old people so, suck, don't they? Old people, are the old people are the best. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> I don't know what you're worried about. Best. Said, yeah. I strive to be that one day. I, said, be working to, I, I wish I could retire today. I told Andrew, I said, those old people suck. I don't know if he caught that. <laughs> Not in the least. No, I, I, I have... It's only I was <laughs> I used to teach uh, uh, filmmaking uh, for for a few years and you did? trying to figure out these trying to do teaching during the pandemic was like a whole education. Um, it was a whole thing. It was a whole thing. So yeah, I can. Uh, I'm uh, just pouring a little coffee Zoom. for myself here. Absolutely. As, I didn't want to get too um, too relaxed and smoke a cigar while I was with you. You know, I figured <laughs> I better just chill for a second. Brian, I'm going to ask you one thing. There is a piece of paper with like a red tag on it behind you. Yep. Kind of hanging. Could you remove that? Sure. It just makes it look a little bit cluttered with that one there. The rest that's, of the stuff, those are your veteran stuff. Yeah, and I think we just, talk about that a little bit, right? Yeah, that's just my so, banking account information in case you want to zoom in on that. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Maybe we should take that, <laughs> that down. Take that down. Uh, I'm just nervous. It's not the right way facing. It's not going to match the others. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm away from that for a second. Let me check. I'm still trying to move this thing, yeah. but I don't know if it lets me do that. Yeah, Let's I'm see. looking at it too, and it's giving me some, some weird... Uh... If you have, how about you how about to, backgrounds and filters? I got I got a thing that gives me backgrounds and filters. Oh yeah, don't worry about that thing. Because so that, that, we'd we'd love to see what you've got. I mean, as much as we don't want to go too, you know, we don't need banking information. No, I have I, some information. On your oh yeah, you just <laughs> want this is where I this is where I've done all my work on the case for. No, and that's awesome. Know, and that's the thing that years, we're looking for. Yeah. Years and years and years of blogging. Oh. I, I, I'm sure I've inundated. I'm sure I've inundated you guys with tons and tons of information. It's Honestly, excellent. it is such a, such a, a, a an appreciated thing to have all this information to be able to build a more a more complete story with. It's been really, really. Awesome. This is really unique access. To yeah, because there was there was so a company. You, yeah. Well, Forty Eight Hours was going to do it first of all until COVID hit. Then we had a company in London reach out to us, and I was all set to go with them. So you know, I put everything together for them. And now, uh, and then and they backed out because of COVID. So I'm really blessed that you guys have picked up the ball. And I'm real, no, I'm real thankful to. for that. There's not a lot of information on you guys on the internet. I tried to do a little bit of, you know, uh, detective work. But, <laughs> but I see you guys do like a lot of mystery shows, murder mystery shows and stuff. I thought that was pretty cool. My kids are into that. There's a whole combination. It's actually I'm I'm relatively new to the company, and this so is am I. yeah we're both <laughs> kind of new. Second day. <laughs> second day. <laughs> second day in the office. Yeah. Oh my yeah, god! My first month. So. How did uh, how I did Tom do? Job. You guys just finished up with Tom Guilfoyle? Yes, he we was did. awesome. He is Spider Man. You know we call him Spidey, right? Because he climbed the balcony in 1977. <laughs> At 29 years old, to you know, when he found her because she didn't show up for work when her the girlfriends called, Mary and Steve LaRusso, they called, you know, when yeah. she didn't come to work. But I'm sure we'll get into that or whatever. I don't know. I don't really yeah, don't even know what to expect from you guys for this. I'm just kind of, just call me Gumby. <laughs> Flexible. I'm seeing a little bit of a leg right now. With, Are you feeling the leg? There's a leg. You're like a, like a uh, video to audio leg? Yeah. If you're not seeing it, that's fine because yours is the main. I'm not really seeing it. Is... Can you yeah. count to 10 for us, Brian? Do you want me to count to 10? All right, hang on a second. Yeah. I gotta take I got to take my shoes off. I'll be right there. No. It's uh, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
eight, nine, ten. Okay, I got that, I got that, I got that. Okay. Cool, okay. Um Yeah. The only thing I was thinking of, Brian, the uh the way that your iPad is set up, do you have a, a stand or anything that, that'll let it flip it around so the I camera's do. facing you do? Can it can is it cool to rotate it? Was that sure, let's give it let's give it a go. Give it a spin and we'll we'll see if that Okay, it stayed on it stayed it stays on the bottom right when I spin it. Yeah, probably, okay. Yeah, it must have juxtaposed whatever that word is, to itself, to the bottom right-hand side. So that's, this is the uh, the larger picture here. Yeah, that's what we're looking for, thanks, that'd be the one. Okay, so that's what called landscape. Yeah. And there should be, uh, if you tap on the screen, there'll be a whole bunch, there should be a whole bunch of menu stuff that pops up. Okay. Um, and if you, if you uh, just tap on the screen, it should have a, um, a zoom. What's the, um, oh, no. There's the zoom functions and settings and things. Uh, let me just confirm this again. Sorry. Um, it's an iPad Air, so it's it's pretty brand new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to get a, a gallery view. Are you seeing just whoever's speaking or are you looking I'm at seeing just else? I'm seeing just you and just me. Perfect. Okay, so the, if that's the case, uh, a video layer during a Zoom meeting, that's the one. So if you should be able to change the view settings uh, so that you can go from what's known as a speaker view to a gallery view. And um, the way that you do that is... Meeting settings? Okay, there we go. Meeting. I don't even think you need to go to meeting settings. It should be one of the first things that pops up. Um, I'm at a desktop. But oh, switch to right get switch to gallery view. How's there that? we go. Yeah, thanks. That'll do. Now you should see everybody all at the same time. I do. And I see my there handsome. I see my go. handsome face right there too. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're That's great. who we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> so from there, I think. Um, how is that for for sight lines and where you're looking and all that kind of stuff? That feels okay. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm good, man. I can sit back and chill. You want me to tip this down just a hair? I got Debbie's Just badge on. I got Debbie's badge on. So. I see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I wore it to court, and I got away with it for a few days until the judge admonished me that people in the elevator might see it, and it could, you know, impartial the panel and blah, 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 ah, ad nauseum. But anyway, she was a wonderful judge, so I respectfully yeah. did what she told me and took it off. Point. So That's I'm it. here. I'm here next um, to this light. How am I? How am I looking on light? I can bring this. I can bring this warm good. light. No, I can bring that warm light up. over a little. You want that warm I think light we're over? Good. No, I think we're good. Thanks. Yeah, we're solid, man. Um, from, yeah, yeah. No, it's feeling good. It's feeling good. This is a nice tweet, and uh, I know where I'm looking. I know who to look at. This is important. Um, I'm gonna keep myself muted. Well, I'm, I'm gonna stop my video. Okay. Uh, and I will mute myself. Okay. But I'll start recording if you're okay with it, and then we'll just uh, we'll just go from there. Yeah. Can you guys tell me like what 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 are your expectations for me for this particular session here? Um, I'm just going to ask you about ten questions. Okay. Um, some uh, this, there might be a few more just based on what you say. I might have some more questions to go up from that, but it's just going to be a conversation between the two of us about the case. Um, it's pretty. It's pretty standard. It's all things that you've already answered and you've given us information on. So a lot of this is based off stuff that you've already told us. Okay. We just need it in your words. Um, I'm just going to ask if you could, as much as possible, even though it feels more natural to leave your chin up and talk, if you leave it down, if you bring your chin a bit down a little bit more, when you're looking straight into the camera, it's way more, like it's more impactful. So if you can just look right into there. So you your want eyes me are to keep my camera. chin down? Is that what you're saying? As much as possible, yeah. But in that way, we have you nice and framed up, and you get all the light right into your eyes, and you can actually see the color of your eyes. So it's oh, that's awesome. Perfect. I have that's to charge cool. extra if you see the color of my eyes. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so Ryan, we're just going to jump right into this. Um, uh, so I want. Oh. Yeah, is that, I'm just gonna, now we are recording. Yeah. I want to thank you right off the hop because I know that this can be sensitive, and if at any point you need to take a moment to just collect yourself and gather yourself, or if you just need to take a minute just say it that like don't rush yourself just do what you need to do okay appreciate you so I'm, I'm gonna start off with an easy question but a hard one at the same time can you tell me a little bit about Deborah 
Well, Deborah was uh, just a normal, regular girl, and we all, you know, lived together, me and her and Donna. And when we were little, we just did what little kids do, you know. We we played outside. We played cowboys and Indians. Uh, Debbie got a new bike one time for her communion, and I'll never forget, you know, her being so excited about having a brand new bike and a cardboard box and that was like way above our uh, pay grade as far as our family being able to afford something like that so to this day I don't know how that came about to be but I remember that being one of the bright moments in her life and so other than that you know we we were just normal kids we, we played we went to the store we ate penny candy we you know we did all the little things that little kids do and can you tell me a little bit more about your childhood? You said that like getting the bike was a little bit out of your family's typical price range. So can you paint me a bit of a picture of what it was like back then? Well, um, you know, we, we grew up, the three of us as young kids, and mom and dad had some, you know, issues between themselves in the marriage. And so uh, mom ended up going away, and I was five, or I was four, Debbie was four five and Donna was three and uh, my dad you know had us at that time and he he met a new gal and then my grandma came along because dad dad got in some trouble and ended up going away to Attica for a while and um, so we were kind of like just the three of us on our own until later on in life you know when when things changed but it was it was a pretty rough childhood you know we were on public assistance and we would be grateful for getting, you know, whatever groceries and stuff that, you know, that allowed us to have. But we weren't uh, well off by any means, you know. We were, we were just the average family struggling, you know. Absolutely. And so, growing up like that, I'm sure, like Deborah had, well, she moved on to Miami. So, what was that like? Was she more of a spirit? Was she a free spirit? What was she, what what prompted her to leave? A small town in New York yeah, to, that, like, that, to a huge city like Miami. That was a little later on, Mel. Um, what had happened is as we um, went into our early teens, my dad ended up moving to a small village, a town called Oriskany Falls, New York. And we were on the border between Oriskany Falls and Madison as far as the school districts went. There were only 12 kids in the class in Erskine Falls, so we ended up going to Madison. It had about 50 in the senior class, and we would ride the bus to school and whatnot. And then um, Debbie was in high school. I mean, she was a year ahead of me. So what happened was she took off for a year, I think around her senior year, which would have been 1971. And then her and Roxanne, our sibling, our half-sister, they decided they wanted to go to California and they wanted to meet movie stars. So they took $40 and off they went. They hitchhiked out to California. Not recommended in this day and age, obviously, but back in the early 70s, that's what they did. And they were out there for, you know, quite, well, several months at least, from my understanding. And then they, um, they came back for a little while. So that kind of put Debbie like one year behind in high school. So she had to make up her senior year. So as it happened, her and I ended up graduating the same year in 1972. And we actually uh, walked down the aisle together at graduation, which was pretty cool. Debbie was asked to speak at graduation. She was not, you know, valedictorian or anything like that. But for some reason, they chose her to give a, a, a speech and announcement at the, at the graduation, which was pretty special. And so... Uh, then after that is when she got married to Phil, and then they divorced, and then she ended up going to Miami. She completed her nursing degree in, in Utica, New York, at Mohawk Valley Community College, and then she wanted to go to school to become a lawyer. So that's when she, you know, decided to go to Coral Gables, Florida, and that's about the same time I was in the submarine service. I went into the United States Navy, and... Uh, I entered uh, submarine service and went aboard my submarine. So that's kind of how we ended up going, you know, in different directions at that point. And so 
you did mention like she was she moved off to Carol Gables, but before that, she did get married. Can you tell me a little bit about those circumstances and what that time of her life was kind of like? Well, um, she was kind of, um, you know, a girl that hung around town a lot with Roxanne, and that's how I think she met Phil, who was her husband. And they married, you know, they were pretty young, and I think they didn't date all that long. I don't know how long it was, but when they got married, uh, and, and Phil was like an outdoorsman type, he would like, he'd be the kind of person from, from what I understood, that he would live in a log cabin, and he would be happy to hunt and trap, and he was a nice guy, I met him. And uh, Debbie was more, you know, I want to spread my wings, I want to see the world, I want to explore, I want to grow, I want to... And so I think that's what happened, is they just had different ideas on where they wanted to go in life so uh it was an amicable you know divorce to my understanding but um i did get a chance to talk to her once uh it was a short time actually before she was murdered and i was at my brother-in-law's house in yorkville new york and i hadn't talked to her in seven or eight months but i something fell on my spirit to give her a call so i called her in florida and we talked for like probably 45 minutes and uh, we talked about everything. We talked about this and that and nothing in particular. But it was wonderful to just, you know, have that time to talk with her. And that was the last time I ever talked to her. Um, and then, you know, I, I went back overseas to Europe, to Scotland. And, you know, she continued on with her activities in Florida as far as, you know. I didn't know her relationship with, with uh, uh, Bregman. Um, my sister Donna said, if you call down there, make sure you tell them it's your, it's your brother, the guy's jealous. I didn't know this person, never met him, never saw pictures of him, didn't know anything really about, uh, that they were engaged and she was going to, you know, raise his son and that type of thing. So it kind of, you know, took me by surprise when I found out 40 years later what, what really went down. It took a long time. And... I can't imagine what that must have felt like. So you did meet Brian, or sorry, right, you met Ellen once, right? I'm sorry, say that again? You did meet Ellen once? No, I've never met him. Oh, you never met Ellen? I, met him, okay, in, so. I met him in court. I met him when we went down for two weeks for the trial. Oh, okay, so you weren't one of the family members that she went to a wedding and brought him to a wedding with? No, I was in, I was in the service, so I was gone. Oh, okay. When when she came makes... back, yeah, when she came back to New York, I see where you're going. When she came back to New York, she traveled around, and she did introduce him. This is my fiance, and he would stand up in front of hundreds of people. You know, is what my understanding was, saying, you know, I am leaving my wife and I'm marrying Debbie, and you know, we're gonna raise Brandon, and and so it wasn't like you know they were just seeing each other on the side of his wife. He was he was having a divorce. And he would, him and Debbie were engaged. You know, they were to be married. So uh, that's how that piece went. So I know you were in the service. So when you got the call to, and found out that your sister had been killed, can you tell me where you were and what that was like and what you can remember from those moments? Yeah, it's, it's extremely easy to explain it because it's so vivid. It's a it's a moment you never ever could possibly even think of forgetting. I was uh, on the USS Lafayette. It's a SSBN 616 nuclear ballistic class submarine. And we were in Holy Rock, Scotland. And there's a tender that the, the submarines would tie up to the tender and that you would do repairs and supplies and different things because there were two alternating crews. But I was, I was down in the cruise mess and I was playing cards with my buddies, and we were all coping and joking and having a good time. I was like 20, 22 years old. And uh, the captain came down, and he was had a real stern look on his face. He says, Petty Officer Pantel, I need to see you in my stateroom. And so he walked out, and then I start, got up to walk out, and all my buddies, of course, were giving me the business. Dude, you're in trouble. Oh, my God, what did you do? He's mad at you. I'm like the frick is going on? I had no clue, you know. I'm like, I have no clue. So anyway, we went to the wardroom where the captain's quarters are just down the hall. And we went in there, he shut the door and he was just, you know, very straightforward. And he says, uh, do you have a sister named Debbie? And I said, yeah. And just no, no thought even came into my head. And he said, well, she's been killed. And it was just like 
somebody reaches inside of your chest, you know, just like thrust their hand through your through your bones and just grabs your heart and just rips it right out of your chest. That's that's how it felt at that moment because we were close and that it just stunned me, shocked me. Anything you could imagine, the pain was was just incredible. And then all my first thoughts were, you know, she got killed in an automobile accident. Something happened, terrible accident. And that's all I could think, you know, that that's what happened. There was not even be in the realm of imagination to think that she had been so brutally and savagely murdered. I didn't find that out. Now, the fellows on the boat, all my shipmates, they passed the hat. Within probably less than an hour, I was on a flight across the Atlantic Ocean. I didn't wait for Red Cross. I didn't wait for an emergency flight home. These shipmates of mine, and I'll never forget them, forgive them, I mean, forget them. And I have reached out, you know, over the years through Facebook to meet up with them. Because I never got to go back. I never, ever got to go say bye to my shipmates. And we spent years together underwater, you know. And so... When I flew home, I remember sitting on the plane going over the Atlantic, and I was numb. I was just sitting there numb. I can remember it like it was this morning. And then when I landed, my wife met me, because Irene and I, she's gotten me through so much. You know, we've been together since 1974. So we've been married since 75. So she was there, and she, you know, drove me home from the airport, because I was still in shock. But we couldn't, we couldn't, uh, you know, have an open casket, you know, because of the, the beating that, that he delivered on her and whatnot. So it was just crazy, you know, and I never went back because I thought, well, my dad needs me. I'm not going to be able to go back into the service. And I ended up finishing up my, my Navy uh, career at a local recruiting station in Utica. They got me transferred over for the last few months. And then I separated in November of 77. And so I just want to go back to something that you had said. You said when you first initially were told on the ship, you had imagined it was like she was in a, she'd been killed in an act, like in a collision or something like that. Mm -hmm. When was it that you found out that it was not an accidental, but it was in fact what it was, like a murder? Um, it wasn't until after I got back to the United States, landed, we came home, and then it had to be shortly after that. Must have been, maybe my dad must have told me or something. Because, um, you know, I I knew. Or her godmother, uh, Charlotte Stark, is my aunt, Debbie's godmother. She actually had to identify the body when they brought Debbie home from Florida. Um, my aunt had to identify the body because, you know, and she was in, she has a nursing background, so um, we knew at that point, you know, what had happened. We didn't know who or anything, but we knew how she had been killed. And so from that point on, so now you are back in the U.S., you've been told that she's been brutally killed, a case has been opened. What was that like for your family living in New York while there was an active investigation in Miami? into this case well dad kept dad kept going down there you know he went down there physically went to florida three or four times with a friend of his and he was trying to gain information he was trying to understand what had happened to his daughter and the, the police in miami Dade kept saying go back home frank go back home we got this we got this you know there was so much crime and corruption going on in the 70s and so many murders in florida Unfortunately, um, who knows why the boyfriend was never, you know, the fiancé was never charged. I mean, the case, I don't know, you probably heard or read some of the case notes, but, you know, it was no forced entry. All, and, and Tom, I'm sure, you know, explained it, but his, uh, his pictures were gone, the baby pictures were gone, all his clothes were gone, you know. So back in the day, the detectives on the scene they processed the crime scene and did an amazing job of securing evidence. There was no DNA in 1977, so everything got put in a box. And it, and, you know, and he was never charged. Whether it was because he was so well connected, 
His dad owned buildings of condominiums. You know, they were a very wealthy family. This man lived in million-dollar homes, etc. And he had cigarette boats, and they ran around, you know, the Bahamas and this and that. But um, so no one was ever charged back in, in, in that day. And I always, you know, grew up over the years thinking, well, maybe it was a hit. Maybe it was a professional job. Somebody, she found out something she wasn't supposed to know, and that's why somebody did this to her. Um, I didn't have a clue. I know when her belongings were brought home from Florida in a rental truck, I had to unpack them. You know, my dad couldn't unpack them. And so as I unpacked Debbie's belongings, I, you know, there was fingerprint dust on everything. And it was, it was so hard. And then I would see, you know, her knickknacks and her pictures. And the things that really struck my heart were when I opened up, like, books she had. And then I saw like little flowers pressed between the pages of the book. And, you know, the sensitivity of, of her nature and her spirit came through and it was crushing. You know, her guitar, um, I was so young, but I remember like it was yesterday, you know, it was crazy. Absolutely. I can't imagine having to go through that having a sister myself I know how much that relationship is important and how much it's about your childhood so having having her die 40 years ago and it remaining unsolved for almost four decades what kind of impact did that have on your family and the rest of your siblings and your parents like what what was that like for your family over the next 40 years of not knowing well it was so it was so such a heavy burden I mean it impacted every part of your life because you couldn't not think about it you know day to day to day as um, you tried to go on about your daily activities and little things would remind you you know and then you try to shut it away you know because of the pain you try to push it down or push it away and then it would come back and then it would haunt you for a while and you know um, now one of the things that really um, I'll never forget is how much guilt I felt as her brother at such a young age because I had done nothing personally to avenge her death. And you know, when you, when you think about it, it's, it really isn't television, you know, it, it's not a movie. It's like, because I thought it was perhaps an organized crime hit or something, I had two little children and a wife. And so the devil would whisper in my ear, oh, you're a little chicken coward, huh? You won't go down there and try to find out what happened to your sister and do anything about it. And then in the other ear, it's like, dude, this ain't, you know, this ain't Kojak, dude. This is the real deal, you know? You go down there and start poking your head around or something, you know, you're taking a chance of getting your, something to happen to your own family. So I was torn, you know, I was really struggling. I had a, I had a deep internal struggle with that for I'd say a good decade, you know, from my 20s to my probably mid-30s. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm a man of faith. And so one day I, I just was able to kind of put it to rest because revenge is mine, saith the Lord. And, and that scripture at the right time hit me at, at the right moment. So I was able to um, kind of put that piece, you know, to bed and say, okay, it's not your responsibility to go down there and act like you know what you're doing, like you're a detective, like like the great detectives that came onto the scene later on, you know, the cold case detectives, David Denmark and Jonathan Grossman. But um, so that was hard, you know, as a young person not to do anything. So, you know, you understand what I'm trying to say, right? That it's just like you feel so power, powerless. And that sense of powerlessness it just it invades your entire being. I mean, so many people in the world hurt and so many people go through rough times and bad times. But she's like, you know, was a touchstone in my life. Her and my other sister. I mean, these it's all we had growing up was the three of us, you know, at one point. And it was just like in the way it in the way it happened and everything. So, you know, I'm not proud that I you know, I went into a lot of coping uh, mechanisms that didn't really, you know, help me as a person. You know, I got into drinking and I got into drugs and um, just I took uh, 
I took that emotion and I and I'm I often wonder, you know, what would have happened had Debbie not been murdered? Would she have helped me to keep my act together more? Because she was a little bit older and a little bit more sane than me at times. And so it was like, um, you know, and I and I look at her, I look at her picture, you know, I have it right here. What I did was um, that recording, I think you got the recording of her voice. I sent that on to you guys for information. We have her voice on a cassette tape from 1977. And what I did was I took that to a person here and I digitally had it manufactured, put together her voice on here, pictures, and everybody that was a part of Team Debbie, you know, they got they got this recording and they got, you know, and the list is just, you know, I can't say enough about everybody from Tom to the detectives to, you know, her friend Mary and Steve LaRusso going there to the apartment and she not showing up for work and then... You know, they went twice and then called the police. And we, we got to meet Debbie's uh, friends and, and co-workers. You know, when we went down for the trial, we were there for two weeks. And, uh, you know, they took us around Miami. We met uh, Mary Kelly, her husband, Aaron. And uh, we got to meet Tom. And you probably saw that uh, Team Debbie picture at the courthouse the day of the verdict. We were all out in the hallway there. Rebecca, the, the prosecutor, and Laura their boss, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, Catherine Fernandez Rundle is her name, and she was fantastic, and even the, um, the victim advocate, you know, Andrea Marquez, she, she was just another wonderful, wonderful, you know, strength for us to help us through this, uh, the main reporter for the, for the, uh, Miami Herald, David O'Valley, he broke the story on the front page, I mean, we got a call out of the blue from this guy. We didn't have met this guy in our life. David O'Valley, David O'Valley. I'm a main crime reporter for Miami Herald. And I'm like, really? He goes, uh, we're going to break a story about your sister on the main page, uh, on the front page of the uh, of Miami Herald. I go, oh, really? That's interesting. So, um, you know, to meeting uh, Doc at the, at, the, at the trial, we got to meet one of the most uh, dignified uh, medical examiners in Miami-Dade history, uh, Dr. Emma Liu. She's just a tiny, petite little woman, and to watch her operate in court and watch them, you know, people try to turn her around, the, the defense lawyers, and she was just, she was brilliant, you know, brilliant. There's so many people to thank, you know. Joe Thompson, did you hear Joe Thompson's story, Mel? I don't know if you heard about that, but he was friends. He was friends with David, I mean, with uh, Alan Bregman and his wife. They were in the Coast Guard Auxiliary. They were high up in the Auxiliary. And uh, Joe Thompson and his wife were very good friends of theirs. This was another wealthy couple from Miami. And they used to go around together on the cigarette boats and stuff. Well, Joe Thompson was the first guy to testify in court. And he, like, saw... He had issues with, with Bregman because Bregman told him, Oh, you ought to see this girl from New York. She's really hot. And then, and then, and it didn't, the way it came across, you know, Joe Thompson didn't like that. So they kind of broke off their friendship a little bit. But when he heard about the case, he called the detectives in Miami. He said, you need to come out to Ohio and speak to me. I got some information to tell you. So they go out there and they talk to him and whatnot. So the day, uh, uh, the first day of the trial, we're at the hotel, Miami International Airport. And we're waiting for the shuttle bus to take us to court. There's, and we meet this guy in the lobby, and he sees Debbie's badge on me. And he's like, you're not really supposed to talk about stuff because, you know, it could be potential jurors and this and that. He comes he comes over, and he introduces, and we meet each other just as, you know. We're riding the same van. He gets in the van. He goes, I'm really sorry for you folks and this and that. We're like, who the frick is this guy, right? We get to court. He's the first witness. He gets called. He comes marching in the courtroom down the center of the aisle. I'm like, oh my God! Didn't and that's the guy we just rode over here for with? We we didn't know him from from anybody, you know. But um, it was I I do have to mention Mel about my one of my shipmates, Tim Taylor. When I left Europe on that emergency, not emergency flight, but when they passed the hat and I was gone, like within an hour, I mean I left everything. I was just gone. I had to close on my back. Well. When they got back from patrol, they went out to sea for like two and a half months. I was supposed to be on that boat, on that patrol. And if something had happened and that boat had gone down, I never would have been able to forgive myself. And they got back 
Tim comes on his way to Texas where he lived. He drives by New York and, and I get a knock on the door out of the clear blue and here's my shipmate standing there with my sea bag with everything that, that I had in life that I owned. And he's like, here, brother, I brought this for you. And I'm like, it just blew me away, you know. Tim and I are tight today. 45 years later, we, we, we talked back and forth together, you know. And we he came up this summer. We went on a cruise, a dinner cruise, him and his wife, me and my wife. And, you know, just had a, a wonderful, wonderful time there. But um, Captain Egan, he was the guy that broke it to me. Gerald Egan was his name. I, just, I, I actually stay in touch with him. I, I give him updates on Debbie's story. And, uh, you know, these are guys that 45 years ago this stuff happened and they have no clue. And so who would care to reach out and tell stuff to people? My wife says, you're the only guy that would do that, keep people up. up I, want. I said, because they're all part of Debbie's story. They're all a part of her story. And uh, I don't know. She just, she had some good friends down there, you know. Um, Bede and, and Mary and Steve and like I mentioned earlier, you know, Re Rebecca and Laura, the prosecutors are just amazing. And there were so many people involved in getting this thing solved. But David Denmark, the lead detective, him and Jonathan Grossman, they came to our house 40 years later. They called and said, we're coming to New York. We're going to come and talk to you about your sister's murder. And I'm like, oh, my God, somebody cares what happened to my sister 40 years ago? And these guys come and they come to New York and they come sit at our kitchen table. My dad was still alive, so it was my dad and, and me and Irene and Roxanne and the two detectives. And we got pictures and he, he opens up this big folder about this thick and he goes, boom, let me tell you what we believe happened. Because Tom, the guy you talked to today, he never gave up. He kept calling back, you need to open this case, you need to open this case, you need to open this case. They finally heard him after 40 years. They gave the case to these detectives and the, David and uh, Jonathan got assigned. So when they came and told us what happened, what they believe happened, it was really crazy. Mel, they were handing me envelopes here. I go, what's this? That's a letter you wrote to your sister in 1977 when you were in the submarine. You wrote to Debbie. And I popped this letter open, and I remember formulating some of these thoughts that I was looking at on paper. She had them on her nightstand, so when the police processed the crime scene, she had my letters there. And, and it, oh God, you know, it just tears you apart. But I have those letters today because of the detectives. I have her voice today because of them. Some of this stuff couldn't be released prior to the, the, uh, the convicted person, you know, being able to run his gamut through appeals court, et cetera. You know, you have to be careful with all the legalities and stuff. But anyways, here we are. I, I, I digress. I'm sorry. Well, what did you ask me? No, that was perfect. That's oh good. It's great. I'm just gonna ask if you are if you could just leave the pen down, just because every time it like clicks on the table, I'm getting a lot of back feet. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's all good. It was only for that last question, so okay. it's all good. I do have one more question. You kind of touched on it right now, but I just really want to get into the feeling of it. When those officers told you, we we caught him. There's a man guilty for this murder. He's going to jail. What was that feeling? Surrealness. Just a little bit of unbelief. Like, come on. Tell me, tell me how you call him. Tell me, tell me this is not a joke or something, you know, just could it be? I mean, I was I was so, so hopeful and so thankful at the same time, but yeah, very much cautioned, very much on guard. I was just like and then, you know, there was no slam dunk on this, Mel. This was a, this was going to be a tough one, you know, because it was all circumstantial. There was no smoking. We didn't have the gun. We had the gun grips. We had, you know, the ring indentations on her face. And there was so much there, you know, for the two weeks of the trial. And like I said, the prosecutors did, just did an amazing, amazing job. But um, then we got, you know, interviewed from uh, the local news channel when they found out that someone had been arrested. So Gary Levator, he's a news anchor here in, in the Utica, the WKTV News. He came to our house a couple of times and set up the camera and talked to us. And, you know, Spectrum News, this one, that one. It was just all of a sudden everything was happening. But the very first time when they came up and to, they told us about what happened, 
Then they went back to Florida. Then they had to come back for more statements with other uh, family members. So they had missed their flight out of Miami, David Denmark and Jonathan Grossman. So they were hungry. So they got here late. They hadn't eaten. I says, uh, hamburger okay? They said, yeah, well, we went to a place called Zeb's. And uh, so we're sitting there, the two detectives, me and Irene. We're sitting there and we're having a hamburger. You, Mel, I look over at the booth over here. And there's the news anchor man, Gary Levator, having supper. I said, excuse me, to the detectives. I walked over to Gary. I don't know Gary. I said, excuse me, Gary, but um, I think you might want to meet these two Miami-Dade cold case detectives that are here. And I, and I kind of broke it to him what, what had happened. Well, he immediately got on the horn to his boss and got permission to get the news crew brought right over to the restaurant. And David and uh, Jonathan called their boss in Miami and said, can we do this uh, on-the-spot interview here at, at Zeb's in New Hartford, New York? And it was funny because uh, within an hour, there was a full-blown news conference going on in the restaurant while we were supposed to be having dinner. <laughs> and uh, so then, then the story broke here as well, locally in the local news, you know. And then uh, so it was, I mean, it's just so many, what do you call them, serendipities? So many different pieces of this this massive puzzle, this longest unsolved cold case in Miami-Dade history. And why does it come full circle? Why why do we get closure and so many people never get closure? And I, that's what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful that we got answers. 45 years. Do you think you need to have patience to wait on, on things for 45 years? Patience was never one of my strong points, but I guess uh, some things you're forced into, and it's just it's the way it happens, you know. I don't know. I'm just I'm happy that my mom is still alive and that um, she understands, you know, what happened on the case. She she's not into, you know, uh, having technology or anything, and uh, she doesn't use email. But I would call her all the time. I would up because through all of this, you know, our estranged family. When she left my dad, when we were four, five, and six, as I mentioned. She started a whole new family. So she married a man named Sam Ventura, and then her and my mom and the girls, uh, Sandra and Gwenny and Sammy, my half-sisters and brothers, same mom, different dads, they were the ones that ended up in Florida. They met Alan. They went on the boat with Alan. They, they had dinner. Mom was cooking dinner on the boat for the man that would murder her daughter. It was so freaking crazy. And, you know, little Gwenny, who I hope you guys talked to, she was... Uh, she was pretty young at the time, but she remembers meeting him. She told me, oh, make sure you tell him who I am. and Because she didn't like it. <laughs> she had bad vibes. Debbie was her hero. Debbie was like growing up. When Debbie was going to college at MVCC, she would go to mom's all the time. She heard mom reconnected much closer than me. I was in the service. So the three siblings, you know, they were close. They, they, they got close together. And uh, so, but through this all, the point I was making there, Mel, was... I got to meet, re-meet my mom and kind of start to meet my siblings after 40 years of, just, there was no connection there, there was no, I didn't talk to my mom for over 30, 35 years because my dad's side of the family always told me, you know, well, your mom just dumped you kids and she walked out on you and this and that. And I'm like, so you only know what you know when you're growing up, when people tell you things. But my mom's a loving person. I, I have to forgive her for, you know, whatever went on between her and my dad, that was their deal. And I can't judge anybody. You know, I'm not fit to judge anybody. Um, she loves her kids. She loves Deb she loved Debbie. She loves me. She loves, you know, she, she's uh, 86 years old today. And we go out there, we take her to lunch, we hang out at the house, we, do, we help her with her firewood. <laughs> you know, just getting to know the person that birthed me. And I never knew her, but through Debbie's murder case, you know, just reconnecting with her and, and my half siblings, it's it's been uh, it's been a journey. I can only imagine. Um, I think I think that's all I have for you. I might t touch base later when I've gone through the scripts and if I have another question or two. But I think for right now we're good. Andrew, is everything on your end good to go? All right, Brian. So I think 
that's it for today. And we're, moving, we're talking to Roxanne next. So. Well, I am here for you guys for anything you need, day or night. There are no hours. I appreciate I, I'm it. available 24 7. If you guys need something, you call, you text, you write. Well, I'll do whatever I can to help support, you know, your your project. I thank you for this okay, opportunity. Thank you so much, Brian. It was great to meet you. I thank you for this of opportunity. Course. Thanks so much. Thanks for telling Debbie's story. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, Love y'all. God bless. Thank you for letting us. Thank you. I'm so happy. Have a good thank one. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.